Welcome back. And on today's show, I'll be having Joey Ingram for the very unlikely scenario that you have not heard of Joey. He is essentially the godfather of poker podcasts. He has been contributing an insane amount of value to the poker community. He has been exposing scandals. He has invited super interesting characters. And I'm pretty sure a lot of us, um, whether you just started your journey or you're already a poker pro, have learned a lot from his poker podcast, from the guests that he has invited, or just the content that Joey is pr uh, producing. He is just fired. He's fired up when it comes to poker, and this is this is the the hero we need. Maybe we not deserve, but yeah, um, we should be very incredible. Uh, grateful for having someone like Joey producing so much content and, and, and trying to make poker better. And we talked a lot about his journey. He's sharing, of course, a lot of advice. So listen carefully. At the end, we also talk a little bit about dating and, and women. And yeah, so a wide range of topics. And I'm pretty sure you will also be able to um, pick up something. And I hope you are going to enjoy the show. Let's go. Let's do this today Good here. <laughs> Joe Ingram. It, honestly, it feels it feels surreal to have you here on the podcast today. I mean, I've been watching a lot of your episodes and learning a lot from the guests that you have been on the show. And if someone would have told me one day that <laughs> when I have my own podcast that you're going to be here, I don't know. It feels it feels a little awkward to be on the other side and <laughs> interviewing you, to be honest. But man, I appreciate that a lot that you come here, take the time and um thank you for coming welcome to the show yeah man happy to be here i think uh you know i was coming back started doing more content here recently just kind of being more active and, and taking more of a hands-on approach to some of the projects i'm doing and i was looking around at a lot of content i, I basically just watched all the content that i could find for everyone and then i was trying to find people that i thought were doing a really good job or had a good strategy or put up good message up there and i've always really liked your stuff i mean we had you on my show earlier this year and yeah, I think I'm just, I've been listening to the podcast recently. You've been having on, I think you're great. So more than happy to kind of come on here and uh, maybe do some collaborations here between me and you. Cause I think you got a lot of, you got a real good thing going on here and you got a great mindset, a great approach to the game. And you clearly have a passion for poker that, uh, you know, I don't meet a lot of people that have that kind of passion. So I think it's easy. It's easy to see. It's easy to notice. You just, you mentioned you're, you were, uh, you've been spending the last three years working on your project for, for what your, what your training site. I mean, you know, you don't do that unless you really love what you're doing. So, you know, happy to be here, brother. I'm happy to be here and happy to talk with you. And let's see what you got here, man. Let's see how, let's see how you do. <laughs> that's that's very uh, that's very kind of you. I really appreciate that. And my heart started now beating a little faster. Um, <laughs> you you're throwing me a little out of my uh, concept here. So, oh, it's okay. Uh, man. It happens. It happens. I mean, you got you got your you got your regular list of things. You got your regular list of topics. You just kind of start from the top and kind of go from there, man. I think you, I think you do a really good job with these, though. So far, of course, you always have a couple of uh, questions prepared or you have your your agenda, right? But I felt like so far, every podcast that I did, it was just a natural conversation that has evolved because you just have so many speaking points that occur during the conversation. Oh, I want to know more about this. Or I want to know more about this. And then actually at the end, you only cover one or two questions out of the 10 questions or 15 questions that you prepare. So I always found that the, the, your your story and your yeah your contribution to the to the to the poker world was something that um has been incredibly inspiring and um you've been playing poker producing content um exposing scandals and i was always wondering how do you how do you manage all that it just it just feels like you you you're hustling you're working 24/7 but then you also you see on social media you're posting all that fun stuff it's like do you have yeah, 40 I hours mean, a day available or I think, uh, you know, I think like my approach, first of all, you mentioned like conversating and the idea of having a podcast. And I always looked at it as having a conversation. So generally I write down similar to that, a rough outline of topics or ideas that I'd like to cover. And then they always kind of go, go random places. Right. And then I use them more as like a, a, a way to trace back home. So I might yeah. have like a home idea of what I envision for a conversation going in my mind, but then you never know what kind of great answers you're going to get, especially when you have really interesting people on. So I kind of take it different places on that. So I, I, I definitely understand and relate to what you're saying when it comes to that. And I think in terms of how I do all this stuff, I'm just really obsessed with what I do. And 
I think uh, I've taken some breaks here in the past year or two where I'm mainly focused on studying and focused on doing other things. And uh, I don't know, it's a really great question, right? How do we do it? I think I'm just, I'm pretty obsessed with whatever I'm doing. So whatever I'm studying, I'm studying like eight hours a day. If I'm hanging out with my friends, I'm hanging out with my friends for a long amount of day. If I'm getting out of line, if I'm raging, if I'm playing poker, if I'm making content, if I'm working with companies, I, I tend to, I, I, I mean, I, I, and from working with other companies, I see like, oh, wow, like no one else really does this. You know, like people like they go to their job and they go do something else. Mm. Whereas me, I just really, really care about what I do and trying to do well and trying to do right and, and trying not to make mistakes in, in some ways. So it's, I feel like uh, that's sort of how I approach things. I guess it's not as common as I, I thought it was. This, this actually reminds me of how, no offense, uh, uh, kids operate or like very small kids, like two, three years old. I was now the last couple of weeks with my friends and they have a little kid that is two years old. And uh, this is also something I read in the book and then I saw it in real life and I was observing it a little bit. It's like when kids are angry, they are 100 percent angry. They tell you they don't want to see you again anymore. They hate you. But then five minutes later, everything is fine and they don't carry around any more mental garbage or when they play, they play. They're fully in there. Right. Mm -hmm. And somehow along the way, we have forgotten this ab ability to give it 100 percent, whether it's emotionally, whether it's work, whether it's having fun. And this reminded me uh, what, you, what you just said, that if you work, you work. If you get out of line, you get out of line. But really, you know, and this is something that I have discovered for myself as well, that with all the information overload, social media, being distracted all the time, that you lose this ability. But I find it extremely important in whatever you do, right? Mm -hmm. So, and this is something where we can actually learn a lot from, from, from children, because as I said, like, or they fully love you, right? Their, their love from, from a child, it's, it's endless, it's infinite. There's it's no expectations in return. It's just, they love you or they hate you, but then it's good. Like after five minutes, they tell you, you're the worst person in the world, but then it's over. And then they move on. It's like, okay, now I said it, everything is fine. I, I find this incredibly inspiring. I mean, just reminded me of that, what you just said. And I feel like you, we- you've been, you've been really having some adventures, adventures hanging out hanging out with the family, man. It sounds like, I mean, yeah, it sound, that sounds like a real interesting takeaway from what I said. And that's something I often wrestle with is the idea of getting older and becoming more mature and maybe living a different lifestyle than I came up living and and i think that right it's like the idea of being an adult versus being a kid in some mm. ways and taking something serious or right kind of having fun with it and maybe not taking it as seriously but but still obsessing over it yeah i think that's like something i wrestle with all the time and especially as your environment that your, your friends are and people that you hang out around as they become more serious with relationships and maybe they just lose interest in pursuing these activities that they once wanted to pursue as they were a kid then they become different type of people and then they can also rub off on you too. So I think for me, I still enjoy approaching things from that childlike sort of way, but I know a lot of people out there don't necessarily enjoy that as much for whatever reason. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. How, what was it for you as a, as a kid? Uh, what, what did you want to become when you were, I don't know, like 10, 11, 12 and you're the first, I think I wanted to become an entrepreneur. So I really? was always into, uh, that, that yeah, early on already. Fun. Yeah, I started my wow. own like uh, businesses all the time. So I had, uh, I mean, I just weren't like good business, right? But I would, I would deliver the newspaper. I would go mow lawns, and I would help out my mom's, uh, my mom's best friend's husband. I would help him put stuff on eBay all the time. So we were always like learning the salesman, the sales kind of tactics. And then he sold cars, so I helped him out with that. So I was always interested in the idea of being an entrepreneur. I think I really idolized Western media, and I idolized the celebrity culture a little bit, and popular mm. culture, popular sports. And I played a lot of sports growing up pretty much my entire life. So I was always kind of like, uh, I didn't really know what I would do or what I would be. I had no idea. I just uh, thought that, you know, I wa wanted to be something in sports, or I think a lot of kids want to be something in sports. They want to make some of themselves. But as I got older, I got into cars more and I started getting into car culture. I started hanging out with more about girls, more or less about sports. So my, my just kind of changed over time and and, I, and yeah i just kind of started evolving really learning the hustle and the grind already early on huh pretty much yeah i mean i, I always loved working i didn't really view it as work i think that mm. i had a pretty good example set for my mother who was always a pretty hard grinder and she was always trying to support her family and 
always at work, kind of working hard. And in some ways that's not good because you're by yourself a lot or you're, you don't have that, 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 that connection with your mother as much as you might want. But I think I took a lot of that from her and she instilled a lot of belief in myself and mm. she instilled a lot of really good values that are programmed into us as a child that impact us later on in life. Yeah. So I think there's some things I could be a lot better at and other things that I really excel at and mm. work ethic is, is by far, I don't view it as work really. I think that's what helps out a lot. Yeah. Was it always easy for you to speak out your thoughts, speaking about um, content because you appear as very self-confident as someone who um, comes across as very natural in front of a camp speaking interviews podcast was it something that also in school when you were supposed to hold a lecture hey that was super easy for me or was it something you learned along the way that you taught yourself or was it always natural for you I think I, I've always been really talkative to people mm. when I was a kid I always hung, hung with a lot of friends from my sport so I had like different groups of friends I'd have like my car friends my sports friends my maybe we go to the mall friends right so you always have these like different the people we play baseball with across the street people we play team sports with so it'd always be these different groups of people and then once i got into the idea of oh like you know maybe i pay attention to girls right like oh, let me let me try to get girls to like me so you start talking to people you start mm. learning how to talk better you start learning how to have conversations you start learning how to listen and i don't necessarily think i was i was always great at having deep conversations because i was just really interested person in, in who these people were Yeah. And I think I always knew that over time as I was becoming an adult, I always like had groups of people that I could be friendly with to some extent, depending on how vulnerable I wanted to be and how close I wanted to let those people get to me. So when the idea of starting a podcast came in, I always knew that I could empower people and, mm. and that I could really hype people up because I have a lot of self-belief in other people when I meet and I'm good at identifying what people might be good at. And if they're insecure about what they're good at, I'm very it's very capable to say like, you're great at this. If you stick with this, you're going to have success with this. Like it's, it's, it's inevitability. It's the, it's the recipe for success at what you're trying to do. So while you might be insecure about that for these reasons, here are the reasons why you're going to greatly excel at that. So I can look at people and look at content creators now, for mm. example, and I can identify, okay, like who do I think really has a lot of potential here? Yeah. And that's just something I think I, I've been able to do in my life. And that's what I really enjoyed with the podcast was, It's just getting to have conversations with these people and asking them all these questions and getting to know more about how they think. I just found it incredible. I found it so fun. And mm. there really wasn't many podcasts when I first started in poker. There was, but they weren't focused on great players that were unknown for the most part. They were mainly focused on people that were already generally known. So I wanted to uncover those stories that weren't told that I thought were worth being told. And I think that's what I, what I did pretty well when I first started off. Yeah. I can I can relate to that vision or mission, this uh, mission <laughs> mission to show what 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 it requires as a poker player because we just see the pinnacle of success right but there's so much more behind it and uh, I really love talking about the the dirt and the failures that that comes with poker especially when when you have a poker school and when you work as a coach you see a lot of failure unfortunately right and. Um, Of course, we as a poker school, we also mainly focus on the on the success stories, right? Um, but unfortunately, there are also way more failures that uh, comes with every success story. Uh, so you mentioned you're very good at hyping up people and, and finding their strength. How is it with the opposite if you see someone is slacking, one of your friends or someone that you have a connection with and you really feel like, okay, I should tell him that this is not the right way and essentially to criticize him is, is this something that feels easy is easy for you or something that you rather try to stay away from or yeah yeah i think i just ask people the people if i talk to i say well what are you working on right mm -hmm. and then they tell me what they're working on and i say well how is that going and then they might say oh, it's going poor i say well why is it going poor mm -hmm. and they might say it's because this or that so instead of maybe critiquing certain things i more talk about well why are you doing what you're doing and okay and then How to get back on track i mean it's, it's easy to get back on track it, it, in some ways theoretically to execute and how to get back on track is it's very challenging depending on how your environment and depending what you're comfortable with so i feel like i can guide people that i know quite well because i also know them quite well too yeah so i try not to to that extent i'm sure it might come off that way to some people but i i've always been very good with criticism i love it i think it's i think it's made me gotten a lot better because i've yeah. always listened to everything people said about poker specifically and then content and if they say you don't you do this or you do that i try to at least take in what they say and whether i agree or disagree i still try to consider where their their viewpoints coming from and i try to reframe it from their perspective and say okay well 
you know, this person thinks I'm doing this and I could do this better. And a lot of times I acknowledge I could be doing a ton, a ton of things better too. So I think when I sometimes take that approach with people that I might work with or, or coached in the past or talked with in the past, and it might not be the best approach because everyone really learns differently and people can feel like they're being criticized or being attacked too. So I don't necessarily know if I work with those people as well right now, but it's something I'm trying to get better at. Yeah. Something I've definitely uh, missed over uh, the last years. And I think I've been slacking a little bit as well as um, putting myself attending events or attending boot camps from others where you could meet, potentially meet uh, some, some women because you, you also get comfortable with it, right? If you're, existing group of people that you're surrounding yourself with let it be friends or study buddies and but i think it's a constant grind of course it's you should also appreciate and be happy otherwise you just chase a never-ending um yeah never-ending desire of of more input right but at some point and i felt like over the last two years i haven't really um like in, in terms of close relationships like um Yeah, I've I, I've been slacking a little bit, and this year I also signed up for a couple more uh, boot camps. I, I would do one with uh, Ayed Row. Um, signed up for his boot camp, and hopefully also, yeah, being able to network. I think network is just so important. Like mm -hmm. everything you do, I've never been here today when I've uh, haven't had my friends back then that pushed me through downswing. How how was it for you when, um, yeah, you 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 started your career? And along the way, did you have always a lot of friends, poker friends around you? Or was it something that you needed to realize at some point that, okay, this is probably better to have someone or people around me that I can study with and that can also support me when things are not going so well? Yeah, I always had that kind of when I kept my career early on. I always had a poker friend who we would go to the casino and lose all our money because we didn't understand how to play. Okay. And then from there, I developed friendships from on yeah. two plus two, my, that 10 cent, 25 cent. So we had like a group in Chicago. We would go play together and we didn't know what the hell we were doing. So we were all trying to learn together. And then over the time, once I kind of moved around the world and lived in different places, I always had roommates or I had poker friends in all those spots. And then from two plus two, I always developed a lot of relationships with people where we would talk on Skype and talk strategy. And I think like once I got from mid stakes to playing more high stakes, I kind of stopped talking strategy to a lot of people. I was like, all right, well, you know, now, now it's like, it's a pretty competitive environment. Mm. And I think that I know keep the I secrets for yourself. Here. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I think I, I think I have a pretty good understanding of what, what, what's going on here. Right. So maybe I viewed the idea of sharing strategy much differently once I felt like I was doing a few things that a lot of people weren't really doing. Mm. And it isn't necessarily maybe something specific at the table mm. from a, a GTO. And we look back and we say, was that an optimal strategy to take? I think the way I was approaching my sessions and the way I was approaching game selection and the way I was approaching the way that I would exploit weaker players was something I just really never heard talked about. So I said, I, I'd just rather not talk about it. And that was a big reason why I've never really talked strategy on my shows is like, I, I've written down a lot of my strategy, but when I go back and say, do I really want to give away these training methods I use to sort of build? Because everyone thinks like you got to train this way, you got to go this way, you got to go that way. And I have really never taken that optimal training efficiency where I've made up my own training routines. I've made up my own things. I'd play sessions blind. I would do all these different things just to kind of push my mind places to see like, well, did I take something away? And did I learn something new here? And uh, you certainly realize a lot of, a lot of things. I mean, it's, it's a, it's really fun way to do. It. I think it just made it more fun yeah. for me to get better at the game too. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking about playing, how's it going lately for you? Uh, I've seen the casinos were open in Las Vegas. You have been playing some live games, but now I've heard they might be closing again. Well, what's currently the situation with, uh, online, po uh, sorry, live poker and coronavirus and especially in Las yeah, Vegas. Well, well, here in Vegas, yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's kind of starting up a little bit. There's the plexiglasses and I, I, to yeah, be I honest, I don't really enjoy it that much because when I go to play live, a lot of people know who I am. So I go there, I'm talking, I'm trying mm -hmm. to have a good time. Like I'm usually there with like a friend or something too. Yeah. So when I go to play, I don't necessarily go to make money, even though I do go there to play well and I get really mm -hmm. mad at myself, I don't play well. But it's very, it's very like sad in some ways to not be able to communicate yeah. with other people. But in imagine. terms of poker and, and how it's been going, I think the online games have been really good for Potlum Omaha Cash specifically. So playing in those, I just try not to get too wrapped up because I'm working on a few other projects right now. And my other focuses aren't necessarily make money through poker because if they were, then I think I, I would just 
do more of that, but I'm trying to build up other things and I'm trying to work on other businesses and other projects and other abilities that I've studied a lot of. Hmm. Whereas poker, I, I, the, the blueprint to get poker, at, to get better at poker is quite easy for me at this point in time with the resources I have and the knowledge I have of how the industry works and yeah. the knowledge I have of how the game of poker works. Now you make money at poker. So, and if I wanted to go do that, it's, it's, it's not very challenging. It's just a matter of putting in the time and, and putting the effort and finding the right games. Yeah. You, if you, if you play online, uh, what, what side are you playing? If you don't mind sharing? Yeah, a lot of the games right now are running on these private applications. So okay. there's hundreds of these private clubs. Oh, yeah. That's basically the best model. You can play in some of the more public player pools. There mm. are a few sites here where you could play there, but you, then you got to say, well, what, sh what would be the goal of doing that? Because usually, or back in the day, you'd have to play against these players, the better players, because if you wanted to get better, you'd have to play against the best players. Whereas now you can train against programs and you can you can start to get better that way. So you yeah. don't necessarily have to go say, okay, I'm going to battle the best regulars in worldseriespoker.com at 510 when I can learn some of these same things in some ways, training with programs. And then if you say, well, if my goal is to make money at poker, well, you can do a combination of training, study groups, and then playing in these softer games. And of course, it's harder to get better when you play against the softer players. But what you can do is you can work on your exploitative game in terms of how you exploit these fun players. Yeah. So you sort of frame it in that way you then start to wonder, well, what exactly would be the purpose of battling in some of these tougher games outside of wanting to improve your understanding of what other people are doing and you're doing, and then potentially if you're a coach as well too. So I'm kind of trying to figure that out now is like how much do I want to do that versus playing in soft games versus challenging myself in, in other games. What do you do to um, improve your game? How do you, how do you study at the moment or in general, what is your approach? I think a lot of PLO, I don't study it too much anymore specifically. I think I just try to keep a pretty good mindset when I play. Mm. I, the, the, the bad players are always bad. They've been doing the same bad things for years. So you don't really need to, to know a ton mm. of what the modern theory is, right? Okay, like now we've established on mono boards where we're betting 80% with one third, say for example, right? You don't necessarily, you, it's great to know that, but it's not necessarily relevant information to know against weaker players. Yeah. Whereas if you're playing against great players who can identify what you're doing quite quickly with different combinations of your range, they can start, they can start owning you in a lot of post-flop spots. Yeah. So if you're playing against those players, then you need to be up to date with the current meta is. But if you're playing against weaker players who don't necessarily know what they're doing, mm. you don't have to be. So the way I'm kind of go upon it is I take uh, the upswing PLO course they have. My, my buddies put, they made that, my buddy Dylan. And I use one of the, the pro training programs out there for uh, one of the solvers with, with, with Run at Once mm -hmm. and talk with friends. So I use those three right there and it's gone pretty well so far in the games I played, but also ran well and the players are kind of crazy. So would not make it that hard. Would you also recommend this to, let's say to the viewers that would like to study and learn maybe, um, more about how to learn effectively how to study because there's so much information out there and poker is so overwhelming and there's so many information uh, what would you recommend to someone who wants to get better at studying and, and what spots should they focus on or how to study effectively what would, you, what would be your advice it's a really good question because i think right now it's the way to study has changed so much in poker and a lot of it is around the idea that you you compile these study groups of people and you all get better together yeah whereas before it was thought about like that but it wasn't as as known i feel like now it's more known like that's just the way you get better at things yeah so i would compile a group as much as i could and then the challenge is finding the group and i think mm. things i'm a little out of touch with for newer players because to me i have access to most people in poker at this point in time so if i wanted to get in a group if i want to study with people I can call up some really good players and say, hey, like, let's get together. And, and they're more than happy to kind of include me in the process. Whereas to a newer player, it's a lot tougher because you have to be established in a community. So yeah. something like the Discord group you guys have for Razor Edge, those are really great places to find your people in on poker forums, whether it's something like <clears throat> 2 plus 2 or Facebook groups, whether it's on Twitter, which is a little more challenging, whether it's on something like Reddit poker, hmm. whether it's on one of the strategy sites that you frequent their forums. I think it's about going there, putting your story out there, talking about who you are and what your goals are, and then trying to find people that are like you and not giving up when you don't meet anybody. Because I, listen, when I first started, like I didn't, I knew one person. I didn't know yeah. anyone else. So, like, you know, my friends were 10 and 25 cent players. We didn't know what the fuck we were doing. Yeah. 
So it just takes time. You, you people want to be friends with like the, the best players and they want, they're scared. They're friends with bad players, but you just got to put the time in and, and you can't really, uh, right. You, you, you gotta be patient when it comes to that kind of stuff yeah. and building your network and building with people that you know. Yeah. I, I don't know which book it was, but he rec recommended you want to essentially surround yourself with three different kinds of people. The ones that are slightly better than you, because if you're grinding NL10, you don't necessarily need to learn from someone who plays NL25K, right? So you want to learn something from the guy that has beaten NL10 and now is grinding NL25 or is crushing NL50. So you want to have at least one of these uh, type of people in your group that you can learn from. Then, of course, you'll also want to... Uh, have someone that plays similar stakes as you are playing, maybe also NL10 that can challenge, you can challenge each other. But then you should also have someone that plays lower stakes or is a little less experienced so you can teach. Because what I've experienced, and I think this now has been um, proven multiple times in scientific research, is that teaching is the best method of learning, mm -hmm. right? And... Yes, it's, as you said, it's a grind, right? And I remember back then I was grinding PokerStrategy.com, posting hands every day. I wanted to get feedback and they offered for free uh, that coaches from PokerStrategy.com were providing feedback on the hands that you posted and was very active and I loved it. And I was grinding and posting every day and then others saw all this Ben CB guy, he's very serious. And then they started approaching me, hey, you want to study together? And exactly. some, some people uh, I've had like they weren't as ambitious as I were. And then I, uh, someday I, I, I had a study session with Julian Thomas and Rainer Kempe. And, you know, I think most of you guys know the story, what then happened. Fedor Holtz joined, uh, Stefan Sondheimer joined, and we just stick together. And we, it's not that we came together when we were beating high stakes. We were actually grinding low stakes and mid stakes at this point in time. And I, I, I think none of us was really that um, knowledgeable as we are today, like far, far, far away from that. But we just, we just all wanted it that bad. And um, I feel like, I don't know, how is it with you when you get messages and DMs and people like, Hey, Joey, I don't know. I'm on my own. Uh, I don't find any friends. I don't find any people. I'm always getting a little mad because it's just an excuse. And I try to tell them, listen, it's a grind. And mm -hmm. what I also see in discord in our group of, uh, uh, in our community, is people posting, hey, I'm 25 years old. I want to meet people. I want to, I, I need someone to study with. But this comes across as very, very needy because I feel like we're naturally drawn to people that we feel that we can learn from them. We, that it's a, um, yeah, an exchange of value, right? But if there's someone who's essentially just writing, hey, I need this, I need that it's not very attractive for us to reach out to them. So I would always say, hey man, just, just write what you have, right? I, mm -hmm. Maybe one story that I can quickly share is I have one guy who, yeah, but Ben, I just started my story. I just, I don't know, I, I'm not good at poker. I just started playing. But essentially, uh, I talked to him a little bit. I was like, listen, you always have something, always. Right. And, and he told me, yeah, I'm here in London. I'm all on my own. I left, uh, I don't know which country, France. I think he left France and wanted to move to Great Britain because online poker is, um, online poker is, is, is legal over there. And I said, so you see, why don't you write, okay, hey, I'm 25 years old. I'm from France. I left the country. I, I made a bold step to become a professional poker player. If you need help with that, I can help you. I can share my experience. I'm looking for someone who is studying. I'm, I'm dead serious about this. I want to become pro. I mean, their actions speak more words than, you know, saying I'm dedicated. Because if you can see that someone leaves his country just to become a pro, and he also has to share something because there's so many, there are thousands of players that consider quitting their jobs, leaving the countries, but they don't really know how, and they would love to see, get some input. But we mm -hmm. always, we, we actually, and I feel like it's also part of social media that is, you know, you'll get told you're not good enough, you're not beautiful enough, you need this, you need that. But we actually have so much in us that most people actually have no clue of because you're just clouded with so much bullshit. And, um, mm -hmm. I feel like when when it, when it comes to surrounding yourself with other players and and trying to build a network, just try to provide something. Try to, yeah, uh, provide some value so people can relate to you and reach out to you. You touched on a lot of things there. Kind of first, <laughs> yeah, first so, what you said was about yeah. 
first part about what you said related to the idea of having someone better than you and on par with you and, yeah. and coaching. And you mentioned teaching being one of uh, the best way to, to learn. And if you study, I study the learning process a lot. And that is by far one of the hardest ones to do oftentimes, it, depending on what you study. I study a lot of really diverse things. Mm. So a lot of it, it's, it's challenging to find the people that can bring those uh, answers out of you, whether it's they ask you questions or you're given more of a talk. So if you, I have these things that we, we sometimes do them call like Joey talks where I talk about the things that I've learned that day because I, I like when I was studying six, eight hours a day, I would just have all this information in my head. And but yeah, I found when I work with people at PLO, it helps out a lot, even just how to get better mindsets. I've worked a lot with people on how to get better mindsets for success. And yeah, being able to coach these things and answer these questions is a great way to make sure you have an understanding of what you're talking about. And and if you don't have an understanding of what you're talking about, you can then seek out the information and find it. And then kind of moving on to what you talked about with uh, finding those people and sharing your story. I mean, in one way, it's basically marketing. It's that you can say, hey, I'm here 25. I want to learn. Or you could say, hey, I moved here from here. You're, you're basically telling your story. It's it's marketing, right? You're you're marketing yourself. But it's, it's true marketing. Yourself. I think people should understand it's not trying to sell something. It's like because at the end of the day, people are going to figure out when you try to bullshit them with something mm -hmm. that is not true then they're going to figure out at some point. So it's just a way you're wasting your time and you're wasting the other person's time. So just be honest about uh, what you can offer, what you can bring to the table, and then you will track the people that, yeah, you're essentially looking for. Yeah, I think about like the idea of wasting other time. I guess I never really look at it. A lot of people talk to me because I, I get hundreds of messages from people all the time. And I don't mm. get too many people that say I don't have a lot of friends. I just get a lot of messages, mainly on Instagram. I took off Twitter from, from people I didn't know. So not as much there, but I just know a lot of people through text and Facebook. So I'm used to getting a lot of these things and answering a lot of questions. I don't get too many people saying anymore that they don't have a lot of friends because I don't necessarily talk about that aspect hmm. of training as much in my own story right now. So I think that that those are those those fundamentals are always good to sort of hammer home in, in many different ways to to drill those ideas into people's minds who might be wondering why they're not getting better. And the, the very easy thing is they don't have the right support system around them. They don't have the, the right environment. They don't have the right training partners. Yeah. And they don't want to put themselves out there, as you said, because they're scared of whatever. I mean, I, I, I mean, I've just heard so much now. I've heard everything that you can possibly imagine, I think, about myself. So I'm pretty used to that at this point in time. And when I first started in poker, like I was just, you know, I wasn't certainly as well liked. I was well liked by my friends, but most people just thought I was like a crazy psychotic grinder who like, you know, had some sort of like, he was just crazy. And they were like, I wasn't necessarily having mm. a big win rate in poker. I was more of a, a rake back grinder who got supernova and supernova leaped. And I would break even and slightly win. So people would put you down for not being a winning player. <clears throat> and I would try telling them like, listen, guys, if I can win this amount of money, 24 tabling, like I can play four tables and destroy bad players. Like you guys mm. are delusional if you don't understand that. But I got a lot of negative comments related to that too. So you get used to dealing with it over time and you get used to dealing with people putting you down or saying mean things and it's just kind of the nature of online it seems like these days yeah what 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 advice can you give to uh people in general now since poker is going to be more broadcasted and i can imagine now as we see on stream all the poker sites party stars broadcasting um even not only final tables but also final two final three tables cards up and even though you don't want your you're getting uh, more exposure in the public people are going to see your your whole cards and i guess everyone if you're on the if you're on a tv table you're probably going to be watching the stream and you might read some mean comments what would be your advice as someone who is now um in public out there for quite some time to deal with with hate with trolls that's that's brutal man i mean yeah when you play like i remember i played one of my sessions alive at the bike i played 25 50 plo and i was so like aware that, oh, people are going to judge me mm. based off, they're not going to judge me based off of my, my Potman Omaha game up until this point. They're going to judge me based off the hands that they see here because that's really the limited exposure they have to my game. So that was something that I certainly was overly worried about. I mean, you lose a hand with aces versus top pair in a three or four bet pot. Like people now are like, oh, this guy sucks, right? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. And you just got to remember that. Like it doesn't really make much sense. These people are only watching one session because you make one questionable play or right it's easy to be like oh this 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 is terrible right like people are gonna have these impressions of me and i try to use that as motivation to try to get better at what i do okay so if that concerns you then i say okay well if they think i'm stuck here like well maybe i do suck here maybe yeah. i need to work at that part of my game and they said that's a bad shove well i can either debate them i can not care i can 
go along with them thinking I'm not good at what I do because plenty of people think I'm sure they, they think I'm not good at what I do. So it's tough, right? I mean, it's a balancing act because it's real easy to let all that stuff get into your head, but you get used to it over time and, and the habits build up. But especially for beginners, I mean, they're not used to it right now. So would you just say, okay, get over it, accept it. It's part of the process that you will always yeah, have. Mean, what can you do, mm. right? Like you got to get over it. I mean, you're going to give up, right? You either quit or you, you try to get over it or you, you keep running into the same wall in some ways. Yeah. So for me, like this kind of stuff doesn't even register as much anymore just because I've heard it so much mm. from the, 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 the negative. Like even like the other day, you might read a comment like, oh, I wish this guy like, you know, you talked a lot in this video. I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's my fucking video on YouTube that I made. Of course, I'm going to be speaking in it. Yeah. So you just see some comments like that. They question <laughs> this, they question that. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you just, you get, you get used to it really. And for beginners, I can understand how paralyzing it might feel, but you got to remain confident in your ability to get better. And you might not be good now, but if you put in that time and put in the effort and find the information up there, you're going to get better. And then mm. those people are going to be coming around saying, oh, wow, you're not bad now. It's inevitable. It always happens. Yeah. Are you afraid maybe to, if you get so, not necessarily resistant, but let's say you're getting resistant towards this hate and troll that you might also miss positive and constructive feedback. So because you label everything, oh, it's another troll, it's another hate. And actually there is some valuable piece of information in there, but you just get so... Um, yeah, you just label everything as, not everything, but a lot as troll and hate, and you just don't see some valuable input in there, maybe also towards friends, or you think you still have some spider sense and you pick no, up I, on the valuable I, information. I can sometimes, but I'm definitely like, this is how I succeeded at, at poker was I could, I could turn off, like, I think I am emotional in some ways, but mm -hmm. I can turn off that emotion when it comes to what I'm doing. Like, I just understand it's a massive grind. So I, I try not to get too emotionally wrapped up in those things. So like a lot of the positive and negative feedback, I try not to take any of it in for the most part. Yeah. So I get a lot of positive comments too. And you, you, I just feel like if you let that emotionally impact you, then you're going to let the negative comments emotionally impact you. And then you're going to be an emotional wreck yeah. constantly, always high and low. So it's not necessarily the best approach because then that can bleed into your regular life where you don't necessarily know how to handle your emotions because you're so used to numbing your emotions, which... Mm is oftentimes how you become successful at poker when you're mm. having really high stakes swings and your concept of points versus money isn't quite in line with what it might need to be so that you let the real money affect you. So the way that you don't let the real money affect you is you numb positive and negative emotions there to, to not even let it say, okay, I made $15,000 this day. I got to come back tomorrow. I'm going to mm. do it again. It's not that big of a deal. Mm. So I try to take the same approach with what I'm doing now when it comes to that sort of feedback. And I take a lot of positive feedback in from people but it's, it's like too much feedback at this point because you get a lot of <laughs> suggestions that are great and ideas that are great and all these things that would be good. But the biggest challenge I have is the organizing of those ideas and then organizing mm -hmm. my, my, something like a transitional period of my life right now. So I'm yeah. trying to figure out, well, then how do I structure this game that I'm playing right now? Whereas I knew how to structure poker and I knew how to get better at poker, but I'm trying to understand what exactly I'm even trying to get better at when it comes to this other stuff and dealing with people is just one of those one of those things out of many whereas at poker you don't necessarily have that yeah. you just you just go play oftentimes yeah I just sometimes feel bad for those people because I feel like a lot of people would execute on their dreams more often if they wouldn't have these obstacles of other people uh, maybe even within their own friends and family talking them down talking them out of their dreams or blaming them for something or just you know hating um we're often just you know internet trolls or hateful comments and this is where yeah i always try to also encourage people hey you know don't don't pay too much attention to it the way i see it and i was actually um very surprised at the beginning how mean i think the meanest that i got is as you remember i was uh, hiding myself I was not revealing myself because I just I just loved it I loved focusing on my stuff and not being exposed to that social media bullshit that I was excused I'm a rapist that's why I'm hiding myself you know I think I, I told you that on the on the on the podcast last time and of course I'm a young beam and I was like why would you write that you know it's like it's still like it's still in my mind I, th I still think for a little while about this and the way then I started thinking about this and I, I just changed my perspective is like if there's a drunken guy somewhere in a grocery and he's yelling and he's like, hey, you idiot, 
you also don't care, right? So I see it a little bit like this, that if there's a guy and I see he's just there for hating or trolling, this is what trolls do. This is what a drunken guy does. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I think it takes a little while, a little way the, the, um, the emotional, um, yeah, the emotional involvement and, or see it as a little dog that is barking, you know, it's like, okay, a little boy, a little dogs, they bark and sometimes they piss on your feet and yeah, just move on. And you're not going to be resentful for, for weeks and not moving forward. Right. And this is what little dogs do. This is what, uh, drunken idiots are doing and this is what also internet trolls do so don't take it too personal and it definitely has helped me so the moment i see a comment where i know okay he do he's not there to help he's not there to provide value i just picture this drunken guy in the grocery store just yelling oh you idiot come here <laughs> or a dog you know pissing on my feet i'm just all right it's this is what dogs do and sometimes dogs want to piss on your feet <laughs> it's like i don't right. know i just i just love having pictures i'm a very visual type of of, of learning person so having these kind of um uh analogies well, like really way, helps it's like a great way yeah. you reframe it right so yeah. you're basically yeah, yeah. Idea of a negative frame. comment and you're reframing yeah. it where you see so you set up a system where you can instantly try yeah. to reframe this to get over it because yeah. you know in the past you let these comments impact you so yeah. you knew if you wanted to deal with these comments better you had to create some sort of system yeah. and that that's like a very that's a very great way to handle it is yeah. this idea of reframing yeah. and that's something that you you when you go through the learning process you try to view things from different lenses whether it's from and, and you and the way you, you can view them from different lenses you have to learn how those people view things which is like mm. a whole another study process all together so you're making an assumption that oh this guy's like a drunken guy but in reality there are different types of these people and they might think that what they're saying is 100 accurate because i've gotten to know a lot of these people too mm. so i try to figure out like where are these people coming from with these comments yeah. so i think what you take and how you handle it is a great way to do it too it's just like not even put much thought into it i yeah. try to put more thought into it like well we're, we're, we're really are making these people tick yeah. so i had conversations with them and sometimes they're just fucking around sometimes they think they're being funny they, a lot of times they think they're being they think they're like making everyone knows they're joking and they just don't understand that mm. not everybody knows they're joking yeah no certainly so, if, if I, I you mentioned actually you mm -hmm. mentioned something also about friends and family being supportive of you. And I think the people that weren't supportive of me when I was younger, I just stopped talking to a lot of those people. Okay. And I was fine. Also in family? On my own. Also, in within, also within your family, you just stopped talking to them? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Wow. Yeah. yeah I mean, most people then don't That's believe wrong. in what you're doing. You tell me mm. you want to, you want to be a successful poker player, right? Like most people are going to say you're gambling and, and mm. you shouldn't do that. And it's a negative thing. And you know, maybe they're right to some degree for some people out there, but it, it's not what I wanted to have around me in my life. So I, mm. I got rid of a lot of those people that felt that way. And, and yeah, that's the way I handle it. I don't think it's necessarily the best way for everyone to handle it too, mm. because maybe they're right for a lot of people. And maybe the only way you overcome that is by putting in 10 hour days for a year straight. And maybe that's not necessarily the healthiest way for you to go upon living your life. Yeah. So when I look back at the way I handled poker, I think it was so much fun, but I don't know if it was the healthiest way for everybody to just say, most of my relationships are going to be poker based. I'm going to get rid of people that aren't supportive of me. And yeah. I'm just going to dedicate myself to succeeding at this and living this sort of life that I, maybe I, I dreamt about living. Yeah, man, that's, I, I can, I can, I can imagine for friends, but I feel like, especially for family, that's where a lot of players, Hey, it's my friend, it's my brother, it's my mom, it's my dad, it's my aunt, it's my uncle, whoever. Um, I listen to them. Uh, mm -hmm. you, would you just say, you got to be believing in yourself. And, and if you really do think this is your path and you really want that 100% and uh, just, just fuck it and go for it. It's a good question, Ben. I mean, it's a really good question. I try not to necessarily push my idea of success mm. on other people That's... because I look back on the way I handle having success and I realize like maybe I should have established more relationships along the way with with family and, and gotten a little bit deeper with some of my relationships along the way because i prioritized my own success in some ways mm. over those other things because that's what i thought you had to do and in retrospect i'm realizing like maybe i i could have done that differently i didn't need to do it that way but at that time in my life i thought the only way i would be able to succeed at anything in life was to just handle it this way like i saw an opportunity with poker and I said, okay, I can, I think that I can do this. And the only way I see I can do this is if I just dedicate my entire being to it. And yeah. that's the way I handle it. But for other people out there, I don't know if that'll be the best because 
you could fail. And then, I mean, it's, it's real tough, right? So I try not to necessarily push my vision of what success is and, and what my dreams are and assume that everyone else wants to, hmm. wants to also achieve those kind of things. I really like this thought. I really like this thought. I think what you just said that not trying to impose your way of success onto others because it just everyone is so individual and mm -hmm. I personally also get a lot of questions. Hey Ben, um, how do I stop tilting? How do I make more money in poker? It's very, uh, very gen generic questions in general, but also man, like technically we need to spend 30 minutes. You need to tell me what's your situation, financial situation, background, where do you live? What, what your skill set? Um, it's, it's not possible to answer these kind of questions. Right. And I feel like then when I give them advice, I'm basically imposing them my way of success. Of course, I'm always telling them this is how it worked for me. So it doesn't necessarily has to work for them. But I feel like too many people try to copy what others did without considering their own circumstances, their own skill set. Mm -hmm. And something I sometimes miss when I read books or uh, listen to other content creators that they would emphasize on the point, hey, this is just my story. This is my experience and it worked for me. So maybe you can take a few things and it might inspire you. And I was definitely also on this path when I um, got more curious about nutrition or pickup or self-development in, in all sorts of directions. It's like, oh, this guy is saying ABC. Okay, let's do ABC, right? And you're young, you're foolish. You listen to the ones that you look up to. So I feel like that more um, content creators should have this responsibility of making aware of the fact. It just I felt this was a very, very, very strong piece of advice there. I, I really like that. Well, a lot of you got to understand for like the content creators themselves, a lot of them are trying to, they're coming off in an attempt to be an authority. Mm. So they're trying to speak from a very high point of confidence. They're marketing themselves to you. And an educated person might be like, oh, this guy's full of shit. But an uneducated person is going to watch that and then say, okay. And that's their target customers mm. oftentimes for a lot of these people is they're targeting an uneducated or slightly educated consumer who sees what they say and just assumes that they know what they're talking about without taking into any more thought about the process. So it's a really good sales strategy for a lot of people out there yeah. to just target that demographic of customer. But right, it might not necessarily be the best way of learning for everyone out there. And that's a whole other kind of debate. But I, if you follow the learning process, you're uh, you're going to get better at these kind of things like that. But one of the one of the steps is to aggregate the content and find the right information. And that could be a challenge on its own and then also get coaching, which is another challenge on its own. So you have to get better at understanding aggregation for content. And you also have to get better at understanding how to how to research the people that you're going to potentially be working with and also learning maybe how you learn effectively as well too which all these things sort of matter yeah so if you follow the process which most people don't do then you're going to have success with it but if you don't then you're going to have a lot of hurt a lot of hurdles that come up along the way yeah there was also a question that actually i think for my man olivier who was yeah, on, saw, the, on saw, the show olivier, you guys had a great podcast yeah I thank it you a lot. it was a was a great show indeed um He, he wanted to know, how do you think about the potential trade-off uh, trade-offs of strategic engagement and brand building versus being an authentic voice in the community and what ultimately drives you to create content and what, if any, end goals do you have? Yeah, it's a great question. By yeah, I loved I it as I, well. Yeah, I've always, I've always enjoyed having him on the show, my show as well, too. I've had him on a few times over time. He's always very insightful and... Mm. Those are the kind of guests I really love had on and insightful people who kind of drop some knowledge on you that, that make, make you think in different ways yeah, that you maybe didn't think about before. Dropping some bombs for sure. Yeah. And when, when he, he asked that question, I think that's something that you don't often think about. And, you know, the idea of, of authentic in some ways, it's, it's, it's something I'm trying to figure out because I know a lot of stuff now about a lot of things happening out there. And you have to decide, well, what is your message going to be about? Mm. Your message going to be what's real, what's positive, what's negative, because what's real could be positive and could be negative too. So yeah. you try to, I'm trying to get a better understanding of, well, what do I think this stuff even means? Like what is authenticity when you know a lot of different things that could be negative and could be positive. So 
I'm not really sure about that right now. That's what I'm trying to figure out. I really just started taking this kind of stuff a little more seriously this year. So a previous up until this year, I didn't take all this kind of stuff that serious. I just kind of did things and mm. I always kind of had a pretty good idea what I already, I, I know what the optimal strategy is for a lot of these like, platforms and how to build a brand and how to create content. I don't necessarily follow them because I'm not really interested in doing that. I haven't had fun doing that in the past, but it's a good question because that's what I'm trying to figure out right now is yeah. how much of a message do you want to push hmm. versus how much do you want to talk about what you really care about? Because what the things I mainly am most interested in right now aren't necessarily poker specifically. They're hmm. more big picture stuff like, uh, like geopolitics and mm -hmm. world financial systems and understanding the financial system and financial literacy in general and, and trying to understand power structures and business structures. Mm. And so those things are more big picture. And I think what I'm doing right now with my poker content and with my future business in poker is that I want to help grow poker. Mm. I want to help tell the great poker stories out there. I want to help support companies and brands and people I believe in. And how authentic that that will be. I think I'm gonna have to figure that out along the way because I, I think I'm trying to figure in the past, I didn't worry about it. I was just like, whatever, I'm like a crazy fucking guy. I just love poker a lot. And that's what I'm talking about. And then once you start covering more serious issues, you see the ramifications of those serious issues and you go, whoa, that's like, you know, that went away. I didn't necessarily see it going when you cover these these really important things that potentially impact people for negatively. Yeah. So I think you gotta be very careful about the routes you go down, the paths you go down, the, and the energy that you let consume you. And if you let only cheating scandals consume you, that's mm. the way you're going to think about the world. And if you try to focus on the positive things that are happening in the industry, then that's the way you're going to think about the world. Mm. So that's something I'm trying to figure out how I want to handle it. Yeah, there was actually another um, very interesting question. Uh, speaking about these cheating scandals, um, what was what was driving you to dive so deep into all these scandals and exposing them on YouTube? Uh, Mike well, Postel, America's Card Room, cheating, bots, yada, yada, yada. I think the first one, the America's Card Room, was just like the information that I got hit me so hard that mm -hmm. I didn't like, I just didn't know. I, I thought like the Phil Nagy guy was kind of like a friend of mine in some ways because that company befriended me. Mm -hmm. And I did, I did a cage for them and I did a couple of videos for them and I, I just talked to them a little bit. So I just assumed like, you know what, this guy is like looking out, he's looking out for what's happening on the site. And I didn't know that wasn't the case. Like I didn't know that the, the site was infested with bots. I didn't mm -hmm. know that there was potentially this collusion happening very easily. Right. And I didn't think, I thought they were just detecting this stuff. I just had a lot of faith in security at the time. Yeah. And I had a lot of faith that, that, and I knew about <clears throat> super YouTube channels in the past, but I'm looking at some of these accounts. I'm like, studying them for hours and I go, man, this is really fucking weird. What's happening here. Mm. So I reached out to the guy and I, I think I could have gave him a little more time in retrospect, but I reached out and I was like, man, like I'm going to talk about this because this is a serious issue to me. And it is real serious. And yeah. someone needs to talk about this kind of stuff because it's still happening right now out there. Oh really? And it's important for it to get brought up. Otherwise these operators have absolutely no incentive to really change. Yeah. So at that time that was driving me was like, I just like, this is crazy. I can't believe that I've been promoting this site and this is what they're doing like mm. so that's where that came from and then with the mike postal thing came up it was just veronica right she was she was so adamant that something was happening and i thought like these live stream games were the, the crown jewel of poker that these were this like the, the last true place left in some ways where this stuff wasn't happening so when i saw that taking place and then i see the guy saying he didn't do it she's saying he's doing it i'm looking at the hands like these are really crazy hands like I just and everyone was like, oh, let's find out what happened. So I think that took a, a life of its own because you still have both sides saying the wrong, other person's a liar. The mm. other person's making this up. So that's just one of the craziest things that I've really I've really been a part of ever. And, and then when you go through that and you, you see these things on video and the, the actions that happen after don't match up, it's just it's kind of disheartening in some ways because what what real what was really gained from that i mean i do know some things that were gained from that from a security standpoint in the industry but in terms of what actually happened like you know what really happened like no, nothing really happened out of that yeah so it, it's it's kind of crazy to think that's the conclusion that might come from this have you ever considered um that it's also maybe dangerous because it's kind of um it's kind of amplifying the prejudice that a lot of people have in the world poker cheating gambling and then when you make it public that it might also have 
yeah, the counter effect that it will scare people away from poker, right? It's like, oh, cheating on America's card. I mean, I get your point. I totally agree, right? But on the other side, you know, this is actually the message we try to now um, bring across for multiple years that poker is not gambling, that there's no, I mean, there's cheating everywhere, right? So esports, uh, I made a video about lawyers and accounts. You get fucked over there. You get fucked over in poker. You get fucked over everywhere. <laughs> so poker is not unique. Um, but still, somehow poker, people are a little bit more susceptible towards it. And if there's one cheating scandal in, in 100 years, it feels like, okay, poker is a game of cheating or in gambling. Uh, have, you, have you thought about that? Well, I think there, poker is a game of cheating. So okay. in a lot of ways, that's what's happening in a lot of environments right now. Mm -hmm. So it like once again, it goes back to what I said at the beginning, which is that I, you decide how you want to frame things. Mm. So I could talk about what's happening out there for months. Okay. And your perception might be this is all it is, but it, that isn't all it is because there's a lot of great stories out there of people being able to become professionals at the game mm. and build great lives and also recreational players to have a good time and to escape their problems and to do something that they love and to also potentially hit a big score. So all of these things are happening currently at one time. Mm -hmm. So then it's on you as a creator to decide, well, what do you want to focus on the most? Yeah. And of course, that's not going to look good when you come out and say, this is what's happening on there. Yeah. But at that current time, I said, well, I want people to know this is happening so they don't fucking play here because mm. they associate this site with me because I made me have videos and I posted, I play on here. People said, where should I play? I recommended that site. And now I say, no, like I don't recommend that site for that yeah. because who knows what's happening on that site, man. And that's, if these are the issues that we find with companies, then in my mind, there's a lot bigger issues going on behind <laughs> the scenes because you only see the obvious issues. You don't necessarily see the behind the scenes issues happen in businesses. Yeah. So when I'm looking around and talking with companies and exploring collaborations and exploring who I potentially want to partner with in some degree, I'm trying to figure out, okay, well, what are the, what are the issues on, on the surface? And then what are potentially things that they might not be talking about and what could those things be? Hmm. poker sites are real scary to, when i think about that because there's a lot of crazy things that could be happening out there man yeah have you ever considered signing with a with a poker site as a as a pro uh, a sponsored pro not really i used to want to be back in the day like be, being a poker stars pro was a very like glorious and everyone wanted glorious. to be <laughs> right exactly so i always wanted to do that but i think right now i would want to be a partner potentially with an operator hmm. if i thought it would be a good thing for both of us and that i could help promote poker and promote the site and they would also help promote what i'm doing as well too so more of like a partnership together so i would potentially be open to something like that in the future but right now i'm kind of i like being a free agent in some ways and i like helping hmm. out everyone in the industry and i like working with all the different sites and i like helping to promote the events that i believe in and i'm trying some more collaborations right now in terms of helping to promote certain events or certain companies, but I'm not sure if that's something I'm going to want to do for the long term or not. Yeah, yeah, I, I also appreciate just the ability to speak out your mind and uh, speak about things that are going wrong right now. I mean, I would never say never, um, but I think this is just such a valuable asset that you have as a as a free content creator that you're not tied to any kind of requirements or terms that forces you to say certain things or not say certain things. And yeah, I definitely really enjoy that. Well, I think that's why you might partner or you might work with companies that you do believe in that mm -hmm. you think are good businesses and that are trying to do good by their customers. So if you try to do something like that, then it, I don't really have much issue to say, okay, go, go try out this program or go play on this poker yeah. site. If I think that, from my best research and my best understanding that that appears to be something that they are looking out. They're not just trying to take advantage of everybody out there. So yeah. that is what yeah. I would normally look for. But also a lot of these people who are sponsored, they don't necessarily make money at poker and they don't make money from what they might be doing with content. So their only option to survive is to partner with an operator who might pay them some sort of fee plus affiliate plus free tournament tickets so I can understand the allure. And it's very easy for people that have had success at poker to say, oh, look at all these people that are just kind of shills, but this is how they make a living. So they're not making a living at poker. Hmm. They're making a living through poker. Yeah. So it's important to have that, that understanding of how their business model works versus how a poker player's business model might work. Yeah. How do you see the future of poker, online poker, live poker? I think that it's going to really boom coming up here. 
Oh, really? Because, Didn't expect that. Yeah, yeah. The marketing in poker is like, like awful, right? So it's terrible. The, it's awful. The marketing right now? Terrible. Okay. Yes. So if you study by other industry standards, which I mm. study a lot of different industries, and I study how they market their product, market their games. And if you look at esports games specifically, right, there's so much opportunity with poker and yeah. it's such a popular game. And the people that play the game seem to be really well loved by people out there because it's a really easy story for you to mm. follow that yes i think that it takes collaboration between the biggest marketing budgets which tend to be the operators and the players themselves who are willing to put in that effort and put in that work to be able to get to that point and also yeah. the idea of promoting digitally is very new concept and a lot of the companies are so used to creating content for or professional broadcast they don't understand how to build audiences and build brand and build community through the digital platforms right now so once these companies start to figure this out and once the creators become better at creating content and understand how to get attention at scale then we're going to see if that happens which i think it will happen we are going to see a lot more interest in poker and you can already see it happening right now with content on streaming platforms yeah. so I think that as long as regulation allows certain sites to you to operate and the application, <laughs> the private game world starting to boom, online poker in America is starting to slowly become more legal, global poker is starting to become more of an option, ACR is trying to get his shit together, a lot of options in Asia that are kind of blowing up out there too, the Indian poker community, the Brazilian poker community, the Japanese poker community, Latin America, a lot of the, I follow them all and a lot of them are having growth right now mm. and there's really nowhere to go but up. A yeah, poker is poker in India is big. Poker in India is poker in India is big, man. Also Brazil. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah, it's just start it's just starting there. I mean, these are new industries in these mm. in these places. So yeah. it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see what happens there. But I, I'm very optimistic about what I think is possible for the future of poker, mm. especially now that we have a little competition with GG poker and poker stars and party poker. Yeah. I was just wondering why I mean Think back, these no speed games on, on full tilt poker stars. It was insane, insanely popular. People loved rating those, even though you didn't see the whole cards. And I was always wondering why don't you broadcast um, these high roller tournaments already earlier on Twitch? I mean, now it recently started and it's very popular. I think yesterday the heads up and it was not for that that much compared to the 10k 25k high high rollers. I mean, there are the uh, the battleships, the flagships of, of, of online poker, right? But there were still like six, seven k viewers, right? Yeah, constantly. And even though it was final two, final three tables, there was not so much on stake. You always had two, three, four k viewers. And mm -hmm. it was very interesting. It's, it's a great production. I really loved it. And um, I think if you if you keep pushing it and also, you know, GG poker is doing the same, party poker is doing the same. Uh, you have combined just people watching, just observing 10, 15,000 viewers and you just are seeing the whole cards. I mean, I find this personally more exciting than just watching one streamer, unless I have a certain connection with the streamer and I, I love his character and I just you know, enjoy watching him. But in terms of the content itself, it's so much more thrilling to see all the whole cards and what's going on, right? That's that's what made us watching those cash game episodes, Poker After Dark, high stakes cash games. It was mm -hmm. fucking epic. Everyone was watching it, whether you were a pro or a rack when you got into poker, you want to see how the pros play, right? Right. And it took them so long. We are in well, 2020. Okay. Yeah, you basically asked me about, uh, you know, we took like a small behind the scenes break there, but you basically asked me about why the content hasn't been what it is. And I mean, that's what I essentially created a product around in terms of working with, working with the operators and working with companies and working with content creators to help them better understand what makes for good content and how to do this content. So why these companies haven't necessarily done this for a while is, is I think they just didn't necessarily think about the idea really. And the technology wasn't available to have the whole cards available up there mm -hmm. until I think maybe GG started doing that. So I think GG brought innovating content to there. And then other sites said, well, why don't we just copy what they're doing? So I think what we're going to see is GG do more innovating content ideas. And they're approaching things from a smarter perspective. Like when you only have two or three companies who can really create content at that scale, like you're at the mercy of those three companies. 
Hmm. And those three companies aren't necessarily like poker stars really wasn't trying new things. Party poker, the people are 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 learning this stuff. And I think with Poker Go, they're learning this stuff a lot too along the way. Yeah. So you have to understand how the attention works and how to get people interested, what gets them interested, how to frame that, where to put your content at. So there's a lot of things you have to understand as a creator. So that's what's happening right now is companies are learning this and then it's monkey see monkey do with a lot of these things. Poker mm. stars is just literally watching what GG does and says, oh, let's do those things, right? <laughs> So that's what's gonna happen with them and other people are gonna watch and say, okay, well, do we wanna do the same thing or do we wanna take our own approach to it? And yeah. if you look at the numbers, you can see that certain companies have a lot more success than other companies have with it. And uh, it's gonna be, I mean, really they're spending a lot of money, man. I mean, these companies are giving away a lot. They're giving a lot of, giving a lot away on their, their platforms, giving away a lot of tournament tickets. So they're incentivizing the audience to come. So that gives them a big advantage over someone else who might try to do a stream like that. Yeah, yeah, you know that, I mean? that makes a lot of sense. I was just, I remember the, was it the 5k millions on party two years ago when they started this, the, like basically the biggest guarantee online tournament ever was the 5k million. I think it was 5k millions, right? And I remember I was pretty deep in this tournament as well, finding two tables. And I had a lot of friends sending me a message. Hey, Ben, you know, good luck and big one you're going to be railing. And then a couple of minutes later, I'm like, Ben, we can't watch you. I was like, what do you mean? Just open the software, open the tables. No, you you can't you 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 can't really um see showdowns, you can't you, you don't see any showdowns at all. So it was really tough to rail. Compared to mm -hmm. poker stars, you at least you could watch the table, um you could rail and you have a replayer. Yeah, you, you you could rail, but you, you can't, cannot open a replay. You cannot see the, you know when you see a backhand, you wanna go back, you might miss a bit of the action, you watch it on the side, and there's like that's unbearable. So, mm -hmm. and I was wondering why you, you, you I mean, you rail your friends and you cannot open a replayer. That was what I was wondering. It's like, you spend so much money on setting this up and I had basically all my friends and it wasn't just two or three. It's like a lot of poker friends, a lot of real life friends. Um, nobody was watching it. So nobody was right. I think it. what's I think what's going to happen, Ben, is that a lot of people like yourself and like myself have a lot of ideas that are are different than what has been going on for years. Mm. It's been the same sh the same shit basically <laughs> since Black Friday happened with a lot of the ways these companies approach making content. Yeah. So once these newer content creators have more influence and have budgets and have backing and, and have the ideas and put the scale and the teams in place, we're going to start to see new formats be created that are not the same old field that they used to stuff. And I think that's where okay. poker grows a lot is through the content itself. Yeah. So I agree, right? It's, it's, it doesn't make, it would make sense to be able to have, let people watch those kind of events and watch those kind of things. And I think we're going to see that start to really grow here in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love seeing also how quickly poker stars adapted to, um, the changes that GG made with the broadcasting. Also, Party Poker, I think, has a very good uh, broadcasting on, on, on Twitch. It's it's very high-quality production. And I hope they keep being innovative and just trying out new things. And, man, it's just I, I see oh, it in eSports, right? They're not being innovative. You got to remember that, right? So, Poker Stars, not, not said, right? They, yeah. they, they copy GG. Yeah. So, what we've seen with Poker Stars actually makes me kind of and, and they have a really good Twitch strategy. I should probably just break down their Twitch strategy okay. in the video at some point in time because it's by far the best right now. But it's not it's, it's not saying a ton because there's not much competition from a, a team perspective on there mm. quite yet. I think GG is going to establish something on there. But Party Poker hasn't been able to establish that with their strategy yet. So I think what's going to happen with Poker Stars is now they're seeing that these innovative ideas that they copied off someone else and they framed it as, oh, we created this idea, which they didn't there which is how they came out in the market and they're like oh cards are up like this is the first time ever this is like but really that's not what happened is is they just copied what someone else did a month earlier when they could have been doing this for years so they put a fancy overlay to it that's not hard to do you reach out to the graphic designers that make these things and say hey here's our vision here's our idea make something nice so all that is is graphic design and then it's cameras so it's that anybody can do these ideas and anybody can do these things provided they have the right resources and the right budget mm -hmm. that should be able to do it so and and that's what people are going to start to understand it's like this stuff isn't hard to do it's just a matter of finding the right people that know how to make it happen so 
I think that some real big things are going to happen. I think PokerStars is seeing a lot of success with their current Twitch strategy led by the powerhouse Lex Feldhouse. So I think that he is going to drive the success of Twitch poker for as long as he lasts. And in the process, other stars will then get built up as streamers on the platform. And then from there, there's going to be many more Twitch streaming stars in some ways that are commanding large audiences, provided they can stay consistently and also mm. provided poker stars remains more of a player on the platform which it appears they are going to be able to do because they got to compete with gg for attention yeah on the platform so that's what's happening on there right now yeah makes sense um i mean i just meant that i hope not necessarily i was using the wrong words not that they keep being innovative but they maybe see okay by whether it was through copying or trying on their own it doesn't matter but by having new formats you see you can have a lot of success and by utilizing twitch by utilizing that so many more people are not going to watch i mean we we have to understand we know that a gen generation is growing up that is not watching tv anymore they're they're growing up with streaming they are growing up with all right let's check what's going on netflix let's going on let's see what's going on on, on twitch who's online and that's how it's going to be and it's just getting better or depend on how you, how you see it. But for poker, I think it's getting better and better because you will have more people coming up on, on poker. And of course, if let's say the the quality of broadcasting and just the um, level of innovation in esports and everything else is like here and in poker, we're here because the operators are shy or just too tight to try new things, then we're going to be lacking. And instead of maybe some new players or people finding um fun or finding some sort of interest in trying out poker they see wow but esports is so much cooler let's get into that right so this mm -hmm. is what i think we all need to start understanding that's where no pl new players are coming in or, or coming yeah, from especially right? that's a really good point right if your idea is to grow poker then if that's your concern if that's what you think about which not everyone's really focused on growing poker so it's sort of like a thing that a few people in the industry really care about and a lot of people at the companies aren't necessarily as emotionally invested or passionate about mm. the concept. So I know me and you share that passion and, and we find that idea exciting because poker has done and changed our lives in so many ways. So we feel like we want to share that love and desire and joy for poker with as many people as we can. Yeah. But the people that make these decisions don't often share that same feeling. And in a co corporation like poker stars, these are business people, right? I mm. don't, I don't, who knows if they even pay attention to what's happening in poker. They just understand how to handle their business from a top line standpoint. They're not necessarily in the weeds as much on the day-to-day -day operations. The person who's six down in command yeah. is in charge of that. And if he wants to have an idea, he's got to go to the, the, his, his boss, it's his boss woman here. And then her boss woman has to go to the, her boss woman, her boss woman has to go to the boss guy. And, you know, so it has to kind of go up those chain of command for these ideas to take place. And, I just know enough business people and know enough people in these companies to realize like you just lose interest and you, you don't, the incentive for you to go above and beyond isn't there oftentimes in these mm. structures because your salary is already set in place. And maybe you had some ideas, they didn't get through and you just lose, you lose faith in bringing up new ideas because it's a company structure where you, you don't, your new ideas aren't really accepted or they're acted upon. So if your ideas are acted upon, then, or they're not acted upon why would you want to keep sharing them you just mm. kind of get dejected at some point in time yeah i i have a lot of those things, i have those, to uh, sorry go ahead was i didn't want to no, go, ahead, go, ahead, yeah. go ahead um i honestly i did not have the impression and i have no ties to poker stars whatsoever when i was at the isle of man and i was at the headquarter and we were uh, discussing some things i really had the impression that everyone that i was talking to that was in charge of a certain position really cares about poker like the way they were talking, the way they were thinking of poker, that they really care. Maybe it's just the, the way the, the structure works and there are a lot of chain, chain and, uh, chains that, you know, you need to go up in order to get a decision through or get a confirmation, right? But I felt like the, the people itself that are in charge, whether it was for marketing, for content, for security, whatever, um, I felt like they really care about poker. Um, yeah, I, just I, my... I, I think so. I think so as well, too. And ultimately those people don't necessarily make the, the big decisions too. Yeah. So, but I think poker stars is innovating a lot of the game types and you could say, well, the game types are, not, are these game types are designed to not be beatable games. So they're not actually poker in some ways. And some people say they are beatable. Some people say they aren't. So poker stars doing a lot of things on the side as well too, in order to acquire customers through different game types and also to 
rake them in different ways, to make money from them in different ways, to rebrand what the idea of poker is. So they're doing a lot from a, a top line standpoint in terms of spending money on their marketing budgets and attracting new customers through mm. the products and offerings and sponsorships and, and those sorts of things like that. But they are also attempting in some way to rebrand what poker is from a game where people can make a lot of money potentially to these other games. And then you could say, well, if they plan to have them both coexist, that should be fine. But if they decide, okay, at some point we're going to get rid of winners and these other game types, because now that we've already acquired the customer base to support these other games that we've developed over time and we have enough media place and marketing place structure mm. here. And that's what I feel like could happen with poker stars is at some point they do what they did and say, all right, now we're, now we're changing all this stuff like that. Right. And mm. if you don't like it, you can leave, but our machine's so strong that we can keep replenishing the player fold and it won't really matter that much. And I don't, I hope they don't do that because why would they want to break up a good thing that they have with yeah. these tournaments? But they've shown to be able to do that in the past. So nothing would surprise me with poker stars. We will see. We will see. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you are very optimistic about the future of poker as someone who has that much of an insight as you have. So, Good news. Right, that's great. That's great. Are you not uh, as optimistic, Ben? I am optimistic in the terms of that there's so many undiscovered markets or markets that just emerge, so to speak, as we have with India or the boom in Brazil. Um, and we still have eight, we have still a very unregulated mar unregulated market in, in, in almost all countries in Europe. America is still um, not part of the online poker world. Uh, at least not as it used to be before Black Friday. We have Asia. I think China is still illegal. I, I think there's still so many um, uh, sleeping giants that mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of potential. And even though there are a lot of obstacles with online poker, um, given the regulation and legal restrictions, I think uh, we uh, there's there's I, I, let's say I would say. I wouldn't necessarily say there's a big boom. I would say there's a lot of potential that makes me quite optimistic. Let's put it this way. Yeah, I can see that. I agree yeah. with you, man. And I also, that, uh... and also one, last, uh, one last thought on that is that so far, online poker has not really um, made use of, of Twitch, of, of as, we, as we talked about, of marketing in general. I think that's something we, we could, could do so much more, especially the poker sites. And... Uh, so lots, exactly. of, lots of potential. I think, that, I think that content could, I mean, we see like a Doug Polk comes in and he's doing millions of views on videos and Brad Owens making vlogs. They're getting yeah. 400,000 views. Yeah. So we see that the interest in poker is there. Of course. So yeah. it's just a matter of time before somebody captures that attention. And uh, I'm excited to see what happens with it. Yeah. Very so excited. something I also would like to um, jump in with you uh if you if you say it that way if it makes sense you're very much into business you're uh, very much into projects and i think as a poker player you have some entrepreneurial spirit within i feel like naturally right you strive for that freedom you are uh you must be a little bit crazy to to go for a poker player you're maybe a little weirdo or you're crazy i think we are all or a bit nerdy uh what are some it was a great question i wasn't sure if it was on instagram or twitter what do you think are some places to start looking for business opportunities with Uh, young poker players looking to diversify out of the poker world yeah that's a good question i mean i haven't really ever been that into business ever for the most part i never really was worried about making money or i never even worried about money for the most part because mm. i just sort of played poker and if i needed money i'd go make some money and that was kind of it right i just that was the way i approached it and and even when i ran up a big bankroll i wasn't necessarily like about the money it was more about just the challenge of doing that so I think just understanding and studying the financial system and understanding assets versus liabilities is the first place that I would recommend people start. And then from there, they can find actual financial experts who are mm. the, the Ben CB and the Joe Ingram one of the financial world. And, and they're going to have much better recommendations mm. for what to potentially do with that money. Because that's something I'm still trying to figure out because I neglected that area. And that's one of the biggest things I wish I learned younger was just financial literacy, okay. how the system works how assets work and where to find those assets and, and why you want to do that and why you want to reach those things. And just the idea of an hourly rate mm. and uh, the whole entire worker mentality, the nine to five mentality, you understand how that programming works through the education system. And you can start to trace yeah. back why these things are the way they are. We're programmed to think these way about these things. So getting rid of that, of that programming and, and figuring out how 
financial system works and how wealth is acquired and how financial mm. freedom is acquired would probably be the, the, the route I would say to take people down versus like these strategic, like you should put money here sort of ideas. Yeah, that's interesting. So it's more about acquiring knowledge and a skill set. And then with that knowledge, just whatever. That's business. exactly what I'm mm. trying to do right now. Yeah, mm. I'm just trying to acquire that knowledge and trying to decide if I want to do more business in poker or if I want to do more. Because like, ideally, I'd, I'd like to just make my money outside of poker and then come back in and invest it, a lot of it in poker and just to invest millions of dollars in these content creators and help them grow and, and help give them the knowledge that I've built up through marketing and through attention and, and through business and through all these other facets of things that I think I would be like if I partnered with someone and I had a budget, for example, that was like, let's say, uh, let's say a Brad Owen, right? Or Andrew Neamey, they're already doing these great things on their own. But if you put millions of dollars behind these people, that's how you, and you could say, well, maybe that takes away the authentic charm for some of these people. I disagree. I think that it just takes these things to other levels. And that's mm. what we're going to see happen at some point in time in poker. And that's how poker boomed in the first place was these operators invested millions of dollars in these shows and in building up brands and building up players and giving out promotions and giving out giveaways and all these kind of things like that. So if that was to happen again in poker, and that's what I'm deciding if I want to do it, I have other big ideas in terms of projects I want to do outside of poker, which are related to learning and are related to the, the learning process in general and how we learn things and leveraging current, current popular culture and to a, a learning idea program too. So I have a lot of ideas that are mainly outside of poker, but I need to get better at the idea of business inside poker. So that's what I'm doing right now. Sounds cool. That makes sense. Do, do you know the book, um, the business, uh, the business, the millionaire fast lane? Have you heard about I it? I think I've, I've essentially watched a summary video of that book, which basically broke down the idea of if you want to make money through business, you need to identify what value you can create for a business. And if some, if, if, if one company makes a hundred dollars, right, you can't really create that much value for a company making a hundred dollars potentially, but if a company makes a million dollars and you find a way to give value to that company, hmm. you potentially become very valuable for them. And, and that's how you can end up making more money. So I think that's one of the concepts of that, that book. It's, it's essentially when you're on this verge, you're not really sure whether you want to get into business or you want to follow this nine to five trap. Um, and you might be maybe hold back by, um, yeah, the current educational system and the society and you feel like you're trapped and you're a bit scared. Should I, should I um, maybe stay in a, a nine to five and, and, and chase for security and safety? And I really like this book because it eradicates a lot of the false beliefs we have around our um, educational system, financial system. And basically, it goes the same way as you suggested. It really um, takes takes out all the false information you have and uh, provides you with some very good insights on, 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 on business and actually why traditional jobs are not sec so secure as most people think and why you will never secure or never accumulate uh, wealth um, through the traditional way. And um, I really liked it. It's not necessarily giving you a lot of business advice. It's more the mindset behind it. And it's it's a must read for everyone that wants to get into business. You know, or uh, I, I, I once in a while I like to take a look because it just refreshes a lot of the stuff. I, 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 I really, I really want one of my favorite books all time. I think I, in one of my YouTube videos when, where I shared my top five books uh, for poker player, also in terms of bankroll management, it's a great book. It really teaches you how to, uh, how to, yeah, uh, treat your money. Um, not only in poker, but also in general. That sounds like a very valuable book. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to pick that up and I'm going to read the notes after we get done with this call. So I like to read the notes for a lot of these different books up there. And then sometimes I'll expand or I'll find good summary summary videos on YouTube that break down concepts. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's what it comes down to. It's just the idea of reprogramming the way you think about about work and about money and about how yeah. money's accumulated. And, and I think yeah, a lot of people are programmed by the education system to desire a nine to five for a number of different reasons. And once <clears> you can start to understand modern culture and, and modern marketing and, and creating products and creating services and leveraging your strong suits and gaining knowledge to, to learn new value. Mm. I, I, it's just a lot of things you can do differently now that you are never taught in school. Mm. So it's going to be fascinating to see how the world develops from that standpoint, yeah. because not everyone's cut out to be their own boss in some ways. And a lot of people just work better with someone else telling them what to do. So 
I can understand that too. And I can understand why people wouldn't necessarily want to take that plunge themselves, especially if they have failure. If you go through some failure with these business mm. ideas, like, you know, that, that really sucks. Yeah. It really sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Great book recommendation. I'm gonna check it out. Yeah. Um, I also made a summary on my channel where I shared, shared my five favorite books and just a few minutes. Uh, maybe it might help you to give, get an impression uh, if you're going to like it or not. But yeah, definitely great book. What, what what books would you recommend for not only for poker, but also maybe for, you know, a strong mindset? Um, because most of the books that I read, I, I could apply for business, poker and my own life. Very often, it's just not I can, actually the, the books that helped me the most also for poker weren't actually non poker related at all. But I could just right. they, they, so they many. Taught you like a, they taught you a way to frame something in your mind to yeah you deal with the yeah situation that comes better in poker exactly yeah okay, okay. Mm -hmm. what yeah I think I mm -hmm. think my um, I think my favorite book right now is like Principles by Ray Dalio mm -hmm. just kind of living your life with principles and having these principles that you you base all your decisions back to mm -hmm. so if you're thinking about am I going to do this am I going to do that am I going to go here you have these principles in your mind you say, okay, well, does that line up with this? And it's still something I'm trying to incorporate into my life. But I think that's one of my favorites. I think like this book called models by Mark Manson's always been oh, one yeah. of my favorites. It's about it's a great book, attracting yeah. women with honesty and it's more about developing your own yeah. self-confidence and, and reprogramming yourself to get over these ideas of rejection and jealousy and these sorts of things. And you look at the idea of relationships and mm. women and yourself much differently than you might've been programmed to growing up. So that is my favorite book of all time. And it really helped me out a lot too. Yeah. It's an insane yeah. book. Yeah. Yeah. Once I learned this, like the concept of rejection being a good thing versus being a bad thing, mm. then it, it just, cause you, you get so caught up on being rejected by people and businesses and friends and women that it really brings you down because you start thinking, well, what's wrong with me mm. versus a lot of times it, it wasn't going to work out anyway. And you're who you are. So you want to find people that can work with you yeah. and that gel with you. And that might not be everyone, but if you want to be something for everyone, there are ways to be able to improve yourself and to improve what your knowledge is and what you look like, what kind of shape you're in, what kind of interest levels that you have, what you like to talk about, how much, all these kind of things like that. You can work at all these things if you mm. really desire to want to do so. So if you want to become a more valuable asset to a person or a company or a potential spouse, you can build up areas in those things that make you more of a potential asset. And then you're going to find that more people want to work with you and more mm. people are going to like you in general. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really like this book from, from the perspective of teaching you that you should also be aware of what you want. I don't know mm. if when I, when I grew up, it was like most of my relationships happened by chance that there was a, there was a girl in uh, the circle of friends and, you know, we had some sort of chemistry and then we got together, but it was not really that I, that was the, the dream girl I ever desired. It's just like not me going out and approaching, oh, wow, she looks gorgeous. Let's go over and say hi. Or in a club, I was actually <clears throat> always, I always had a lot of friends, so I was always surrounded with a lot of people and also then of course with a lot of girls and women but i never really had a relationship where i would say that was really um so long lasting or deep and meaningful as i have it right now and then this this book taught me that you should actually be clear of what you want i i never i was never aware of okay i want a woman that like having principles or having 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 an imagination okay i would like to have a woman that is spontaneous um, I can trust that is supportive and also of course as a man you know you want to have you maybe might have some some visuals that that you're really attracted to so want to be blonde or brunette tall big small whatever write it down be aware of it and then you know go for it and I feel like as a man we I don't know we kind of get um, our self-confidence taken away and pushed down and we're being made little and we kind of get needy and try to you know be always the nice guy it doesn't mean you have to be a douchebag but we are not really going for what we actually want because this right. will make you us happy this has nothing to do with being arrogant or a douchebag and i actually realized wow because then i'm happy with the person i'm together with because i want to be together with her not because it was just a situation of chance and society told me i need to have a girlfriend because then i'm cool and i'm this uh, cool guy that is getting recognition from its friends. No, actually, there's a girl I want to be together with. And then I can also, 
you know, give her way more than I could ever imagine I was, I could give because in the previous relationship, I was not really happy. Mm-hmm. So it was just together because I felt like I, I had to be together with someone or I, I needed to have some, a girl, you know, it's just a complete different change of perspective for me. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, yeah, it's a good point you bring up about the book talking about that. It's just having it. I mean, it's like anything. If you have a clear vision yeah. of what yeah. you like and if you become self-aware of what you're interested in, I think for me, I tried to, I, I never really, you know, I'm trying to take it more seriously. The idea of, of being in a relationship, I was always kind of just focused on having a good time and yeah. not being serious. But yeah, now, Ex- exactly. Like just having a good time, you know, as right. a, it was like, oh, I need to have a relationship. And then you go and you come across as needy, but just go have a good time, find people you want to have in your life. And then the net relationship will naturally appear. That's what it seems like. Happen- I mean, for me, it just, I've, I've never had to put that much thought into meeting people because it's mm. always been so easy, yeah. especially when you have confidence and, you know, it's just like, you just, I just talk to a lot of people anyway. So I, yeah. I feel like I can talk to people. I, I'm interested in people. I ask them questions. Where are you from? What are you doing? What do you like to do? What are you passionate mm. about? What are you excited about? What are you working on? Can I help you out in any ways? Now I can help people out in a lot of ways because I have a lot of knowledge and I know a lot of people. Mm. So I offer a lot of value to people that I meet, especially if they're right. Maybe we don't necessarily gel. They might be into certain things that I'm not as I'm not as knowledgeable about, but I'm very interested in asking questions about what, what they're passionate about too. So I think those are just things that people tend to like is people who ask questions and let them express themselves and let them connect on some level. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's rocket science. I just don't think about a lot of stuff anymore. But I used to, I used to never know how to think about all these things, but I'm a little out of touch with it mm. because to me, it's just like second nature now in some ways, but that's what makes me kind of not a good coach. And a lot of times is that I don't really articulate what I probably do well or that other people want to do well. I just assume everyone else does it. And then when I start really thinking about it, I go, oh, well, maybe I should, maybe I should emphasize these things more because they've really helped me out a lot. Yeah. I remember also I was quite quite brainwashed at the beginning of my endeavor in in in, in dating. You know, of mm-hmm. course, as a young man, you are getting curious. Okay, how to approach women, uh, how to get women, and I was horrible. Like ten step system here, how to react when uh, she's framing you in that way. When you give sh- when she gives you that shit test and. <laughs> Oh, dude, I was, it was so overwhelming. I felt like that that's science. And at some point, also at this point in time, when I read this book and I met some people, hey, it's not that complicated. It's just more about confidence, figuring out what you want and just simply going there, saying hi and finding out who this person is. And and, and actually the moment I realized, okay, f- what I want. And, and, and th- then also a small talk is naturally happening because you know what you want and then you're asking questions related to to find out whether this person is a fit and very often just whether it's sport or she's interested in something you ask questions or you see something that you recognize you ask something it was not that oh you know there was this line from page 44 about when i'm in grocery i need now to apply this line you know it's just like it was all fake you know Mm -hmm. so that that was very um very eye-opening it was yeah. not so complicated. It was yet, of course, very hard, right? Like nobody taught you how to just go to a girl and, and, and say hi or in general, go to strangers, ask for help or whatever. Uh, something that, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of people need, like they study through books and resources mm-hmm. like that because they didn't have experience when they were younger. Yeah. I think I had a lot of experience when I was like 17, 18, 19. Mm-hmm. You know, we were just like we were like crazy guys, man. We used to, we used to go t- like to go to the mall and just like talk to any all the girls walking by us. You know, so it was like you get a lot of practice in that moment. You know what I mean? It's, like, it's a great experience. It's it's <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a- great. You don't know it at the time, but like you're getting rejected a lot. And you're like, oh, okay, whatever. Yeah. All right, next. You know, it's like. But now I like the approach better. Now of the idea of knowing what you want and and trying to identify. I mean, I just you know now I've been dating someone for a while, so I haven't really been. I haven't been single like that for a long time. So yeah. my mindset's more of making that work versus the idea of like approaching from a single man's perspective and they each have their pros and each have their cons. And that's something yeah. I'm trying to work out right now. Yeah. We also did a lot of comfort zone challenges because at some point I also realized Dude, what, what, what were they called? Comfort zone challenges. What's that mean? So you do oh, st- comfort zone challenges. Okay. Yeah. That sounds fun. Yeah. Um, there was a guy in Vienna who, com- I think they're called comfort zone crushers. And I came across his content, I don't know, six, seven years ago. And I realized, my camera keeps freezing one second. I just have to, 
it's it's not really about what you say. It's really just about your confidence. It's just about feeling okay in awkward situations. Like you're not going to die. Of course, right. it tracks back to, I don't know, like millions of years ago or whenever when, you know, we were, when we are, were outsiders, outlaws, we kicked out of society, we wouldn't survive, right? So we needed to belong to society. So we tried to um, match the, the rules and paradigms and beliefs of society to not stand out and potentially get kicked out. So we're always afraid to stand out a little bit, get judged gets awkward mm -hmm. and we try to avoid the rejection as you mentioned which is actually important for your growth and those comfort zone challenges basically we re rewire you that in those situa situations it's totally fine so you do stuff you go in public uh, and you lie on the ground you just lie there and everyone is looking at you like everyone is staring at you and for especially for people that don't have a lot of confidence and really feel awkward in those situations it's a challenge i i did that shit or you go to strangers you ask them in the you ask them for 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 directions or you ask a random questions hey uh my girlfriend or ex-girlfriend has birthday next week she invited me but it's an awkward situation oh i don't know what to buy and you start poking yourself in the nose and you stay there and you see how they judge you and it's and you, you put yourself in those very awkward situations or you just you go in front of a restaurant with like big windows and you just stay, you just stand there like mouth open and you just look at, you see the entire restaurant is staring at you and you stay there for three minutes. You can feel the sweat. You can feel how you get judged. Like, the, Oh my God, this idiot, what is this idiot doing? And, um, yeah. you do this a couple of times and then afterwards, just, you don't care that much anymore. It, it really mm -hmm. helps you to, to actually gain a lot of confidence. Uh, we did that shit. I, I remember with my shit. former flatmate back then in Stockholm, we, I uh, did this also here a bit in Vienna, especially in Sweden. We did this quite a lot. Um, I mean, it sounds interesting, right? And very atypical. Tra it's like a different training method, right? It just yeah. goes back to alternative ways of training your mind yeah. to get over these kind of things like that. So it makes sense, right? That sounds like it's not. I think now when I think about the idea of comfort, where, like I would just rather not. I don't want to necessarily draw attention to myself. I just don't see the, the reason to do it when I'm going out in some situations. But of if course. I'm around groups of people and stuff like that, I'm pretty yeah right, I'm, i mean I'm, if you're very talkative and you feel confident like you don't necessarily need it right um mm -hmm. but if you feel if you don't if you don't have that confidence i felt like back then i def definitely didn't have the confidence and and i came across this con and i was like wow that makes a lot of sense there's also yeah, ted think... there's also ted talk from this guy um comfort zone crusher and he basically came up with this idea and he created an entire like worldwide movement it was insane Wow. And yeah, I also well, had a course. I, I remember a TED talk I watched. It was about a guy who gave a TED talk on self-confidence, Dr. Ivan Joseph. And then I got him on my podcast. That was one of the only non-poker podcasts I've done. I've done like three. He was one of them because I watched this thing about self-confidence and talked about repetition, 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 and positive reinforcement while you're learning versus negative reinforcement while you're learning, which, you know, I could probably take some of that advice myself right now that I think about it. But uh, yeah, you know, I find this uh, interesting the idea of self-confidence. I guess for me, I've always got confidence from just achievement. So whether it's beating games and excelling at sports and then excelling with my workout goals and excelling with, with meeting women and then excelling with poker. So I just sort of stack those confidence that you just do so many things, right? And then eventually you're like, well, I can do anything I want to do because I know I can put the work in and put the effort in. I know how to get, get it done. So a lot of people out there haven't feel like they've really done much, but in reality, we've all accomplished a lot out there. Yeah. If you haven't, then set a goal for yourself in the gym. <clears throat> like for me, it was bench press. I wanted to bench press 315 when I was 19 years old. And then I started working towards that goal. And then when I, I achieved it, I was like, well, if I can do that, I can probably do most things. Yeah. Yeah. That was uh, that was how I built up a lot of confidence back in the day. Video games helped out a lot, though, too. I really? Was, how? I was uh, I was really good at video games. I was uh, I love playing like checkers. I, I was like a, played like competitive checkers online. And I played like the competitive Madden online and. I always loved beating all these different games. So to me, it was just the idea of like, when I got into poker, I just, the idea of beating poker was getting to the highest stakes. So that's mm. what I just assume that's what you should do. Yeah. Cause now I do it a little differently, luckily. Yeah. But it was certainly a motivator for poker when I first started it. Yeah. Interesting. Actually for me, I realized when I left Germany that I don't have as much confidence as I thought I have, because in Germany I had a big circle of friends and again, like, Everything was given. I was like, I was always in a comfortable place. But then when I left Germany and I moved to England and you had to build a new circle of friends and uh, 
the women weren't just there. They weren't just knocking on the door. Hey, Ben, welcome to Brighton. Let's now hook up, right? It's like, that's how, how, how it happened. So, and um, yeah, so then I had to learn, okay, how to get to know to, to women. That's how I started realizing, fuck, dude, you, you suck shit. You <laughs> got it. <laughs> you, you, no, no, but seriously, right? Yeah. And um that's where I started realizing, okay, there there is something. There's something like, what's going on? Why is it so difficult? Mm -hmm. um, and that was the process. And then also in Sweden, uh, when we went out and just not necessarily mm -hmm. just, you know, to um, approach women, just to do all sorts of things, just to mm -hmm. get more confident, being okay with being in an awkward situation, not, not being okay with um, being judged, I think. This has already also really helped me with with my poker game and trying out new concepts, not caring what other things. If if, if it looks like a massive punt, it helped me in all areas: my business, my relationships to friends, um, just being more honest, saying more what I think. Also, I got more empathic. I just I don't know more vulnerable. I was okay, okay. Uh, sometimes I feel weak. If I need to cry, I need to cry. Just I don't know. It just it has changed. Uh, in, in so many ways and I'm very very appreciative uh, for those times shoot out to Niels who was my former flatmate if he's watching it we have been doing some uh, very some interesting stuff shit, yeah. I mean it, may, it makes sense right kind of trying to apply that concept to your the rest of your life I don't think I actually do that now that I think more about that I think the same like ignorant confidence I had when I was younger I'm a little more self-aware now mm. and I'm aware of you know where my life faults are and and the thing mistakes I've made and the things I wish I could do better and could do differently. And I think that impacts my ability to get outside my comfort zone now for fear of potentially making mistakes again, that I don't necessarily want to make. So, yeah, I think that's, that's something I'm definitely thinking more about now. And, and can you have success with both approaches? I think you can, but yeah, yeah. I mean, the idea of kind of putting yourself out there and, and not worrying about being judged for whatever you want to create, I think that's a challenge that I certainly face. Yeah. Cause I, I sort of just kind of stick to my main core formats of content and I have probably like a thousand ideas, but I end up just kind of doing the same ones over and over again for the most part. And I really never put all my ideas into it. Mm. Just, uh, yeah, you know, it's something I've always, I've always kind of had with what I did because I, I understand the attention that comes with the success and it's good and bad in some ways too, because it can be really overwhelming for a lot of times. Raise your confidence coming soon, Joy, huh? Or raise your dating? Raise your, well, I always said, I think <laughs> what I was best at was meeting women. So, mm. but you know, I never really talked about that in my content and uh, it would come up, it'd be joking, right? But like, it, you know, it's definitely the thing I knew best for a long time. Cause that's all I was, I, I knew that better in poker because that's all I was always into. I was just into meeting people. I, mean, I met guys, met women. And like, I was dating all these people. I just loved meeting people. Mm. So I think that's what helps doing a great podcast. Is I just love talking to people. So I could talk to anyone, like a successful person, a non-successful person, a rich. I could talk. I could relate with anyone on some level because I've sort of lived many different lifestyles. Maybe not like an uber billionaire kind of guy. You can't necessarily relate to that level of wealth and perspective on that. But I could ask questions that would get him to open up and explain where he comes from more than I would learn from his perspective. So then I would have an idea of where that person approached it from. Yeah. So I think that greatly benefits you for podcasting specifically conversating specifically mm. is that you have confidence in your ability to to, to communicate yeah and very often yeah. it's just not the way what we say it's more about how we say it right we can talk about the most trivial things but if you're very passionate about it, it it's it's contagious and people feel it and like mm. if you even if you talk about um the most boring gto stuff if if you do it passionate uh, people are gonna like it. Uh, yeah, they might not understand what the hell you're saying. But yeah, but I like it. yeah, <laughs> it's like, well, this guy has some energy, right? Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's a good point. Yeah, it's a really good point. Great, man. Uh, I really love talking about this. I, it could go uh, forever. But before we wrap it up, I I have one more question uh, for you. As a as a as as everyone knows, you're involved in a lot of projects, poker, business. What is currently the the biggest obstacle that you are that you're facing uh, business wise, but also personally organization. Oh my God. It's so hard. Really? So basically right now I'm trying to like organize my, you know, my, my, let's say, let's frame it like this. Okay. So let's say 
my game, right? My content game, my business game. I'm trying to figure out, okay, well, how do I get better at content, right? Well, there's a lot of ways I can get better at content, whether it's through production level, whether it's through the creative process, mm. whether it's through the ideas I put out there, then I got to figure out what are those ideas? Why would I put them out there? Who would they be for? Who are the people that can help me out with production? Who can help me out with graphics? Should I do them all myself? Mm. Who can help me out with marketing on all these different platforms? How do I organize the input I'm taking in? How do I organize the ideas I have? So all these kind of things like that are all bubbling up here. And, and, and I'm trying to figure out, I can't do it how I used to do it, which is just like pure obsession, right? Like yeah. I'll power through it. I'll be inefficient. I'm trying to be more efficient with my approach. So scaling, organizing, planning is by far my weakest thing that I need to get better at. Okay. So that is definitely my biggest challenge is that just takes so much energy every day to do what I want to do with the vision I have for what I want to be. And now if I, I can, I can do that or I can be more efficient, which is I could delegate and I could mm. outsource and I could collaborate and I could work together. So that's one major area that I'm trying to get better at right now. And then also trying to find people I want to collaborate with more Yeah, because I think that is just more fun. It's, it's cool doing shit by yourself, but it's way more fun to do, do content with other people. Yeah. So those are probably my biggest areas of challenge right now, which is a big area. It's guy, something I got to figure out and I'm going to figure it out. And anything personal or maybe in your personal life? Well, I mean, this is a fucking relationship. I mean, you know, it seems like a, it's like a Chinese, Chinese maze. You know what I mean? Like a Chinese, it's like you're trying to install a Chinese puzzle and you don't know what the hell you don't know what you're reading. Right. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure out how to balance the idea of having okay. a brand vision for your business or for your life combined with a relationship where the mm. dynamic might be a little bit different. Yeah. I Definitely, see. that's that's a huge challenge. Huge. I also I also wanted to know about your how's your diet and an exercise routine look like. You're you're also very much into, um, stay sharp, stay strong. Yeah, I I think that I I'm I'm near some of the strongest I've been in a lot of my lifts right now. I think my diet is good until like go at nighttime comes. I take an edible and then you know you start consuming some food. You're eating mm -hmm. back popcorn like. So my nighttime diet needs to clean up a little bit. Mm. My actual workouts are sort of basic, but they're improving. They're consistent. And my strength and my gains are quite high, but I could focus on, I could be more well-rounded in my workouts. I could challenge myself more with more boxing related exercises as well too. Me and my girl do some jujitsu a lot. You know, where she's oh, always, cool. I'm always letting her choke me out and stuff like that. It's kind of fun. She tries to get me in submissions. I try to fight her off and you know, I'm a lot bigger than her so I can overpower her. So I didn't try not to do that. So I'm very much into being active and doing more things. And especially once uh, this stuff ends with the world lockdown, I'm going to be doing a lot more outdoors activities and connecting with nature, more of connecting with the online world, like kind of get more yeah. back into. It. Yeah. Well, well, what would, what is your diet uh, looking like? Uh, do you, do you follow any specific diet plan? Uh, I follow the diet where my girlfriend cooks, cooks great food all the time. So I always say I want really healthy foods, a lot of chicken, a mm. lot of vegetables, a lot of rice, a lot of those sorts of meals like that. So we eat pretty, I mean, that's been one of the big, one of the hardest things is eating healthy for me. Mm. And that's certainly one of the, the greatest areas that, that she helps me out with is just eating a lot of fruit, eating a lot of vegetables, eating a lot of GTO food that you don't, I don't, it's kind of automated in some ways. I don't have to worry about it too much. I love that. Yeah, I think it's, I struggle with it a lot, right? Like just fast food and how do you mm. make your food? Like you got to cook all your meals and it's just like, it was a very hard process for me to kind of understand better, but I learned how to cook and learn how to do those things, learn how to meal prep, learn how to make chicken breast, put them in a, a plastic bin, have my rice in there that I would either cook up or I'd be able to get the 90 second rice versions that were relatively yeah. healthy and organic and then combine that with vegetables that are very easy to saute or very easy to put into the oven. You put them on a pan, you put some oil, you put them in there, you heat them up. I mean, it's not rocket science for a lot of this stuff, but it certainly helps when someone else handles that stuff yeah. because you can put your energy into other projects that you have. Yeah, for sure. GTO oh. foods. Uh, how many cheat days a week? Oh, uh, man, not many. Like I, I would just eat the same thing every day. I don't really mind, but you know, when you're with someone else, they want to eat other foods and they want to eat different things. So I, you know, she likes to get out of the house more. I'm fine literally staying inside and just grinding for the next like two months on what I'm working on right now. I don't, I, I'm 10, I got, I got 10 hour days in me every day. You know what I mean? I wake up, I'm ready to get the fuck after it every day. So, yeah. but that's not how necessarily other people operate. So you have to, balance a little bit i hear you i can relate to that my girlfriend is saying i'm living in a cave 
So yeah. sometimes she's trying to get me out of my cave. And... Well, you just got out of the cave. You were you were outdoors, man. You were having a pretty good time. I was enjoying following the stories that you were having. You guys, you yeah, crew, kind of got together in, in, uh, in Germany. In a nice yeah. little area it was looking nice yeah. there. Uh, but for three months, we were just also being in quarantine here. And I mean, of course, we had the opportunity to go out and... Uh, but nothing was really open. So apart from going on a lake or something in nature, it's just like, okay, we're going to be grinding hard, getting a lot of work done. But it's after three months, we definitely felt the need to see something, meet people. And yeah, definitely miss it, man. Just being on, on water, being surrounded by trees, which just felt so good. Oh, yeah. yeah. Can't wait. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take a little break here for a couple of days coming up. So yeah, that'll be my recharging time. We'll see what happens. Let's see how it goes. I hope you will recharge very well. Man, I... Thank you so much also from the entire community, from the entire Poker World, everything you do, everything I've done in the podcast, so much value, so much content. We love you, Joey. I think I speak for you for the entire community. Thanks again for taking the time. Thank and you, we'll see what, what will happen in the future. And I think something tells me I think we'll do some more content together. So it'll be fun. I got some ideas. I've been thinking about some ideas me and you could do together because... Uh, I just think I, I come up with some cool stuff. It'd be a lot of fun for both of us. When it wouldn't would be like stressful content, it's like easy content. So it's it's pretty fun. I, to ideas. Even stressful content is kind of like I, I don't mind stressful content. I don't <laughs> I know. Say you I say, like the oh, it's <laughs> poker related or stuff that you enjoy talking about or producing anyway. I don't, I, I don't know. Like it can never be that stressful. I see what you're saying. So I maybe I stress myself out sometimes with my like, you know, making some of these news vids. I'm like, I want to be like very precise. Mm. I want to mm. be knowledgeable about what I'm talking about. And I want to understand all the angles. So I'm like, uh, mm. you know, what the hell do I say? Yeah. So for me, sometimes that talking poker, though, that's always been pretty easy. So, I, you know, how to get better at poker. I've always enjoyed that. And I just don't find it as challenging anymore, maybe. And that's why it isn't a core feature of, of my content themes, I guess you could say. I, I think people would like to hear more about what you have to say about how to get women, how to get more confident. I think this is something that you are probably very good at. And I think this also attracts a large audience. I'm sure my girlfriend would love me me brainstorming on how to pick up more women. <laughs> she, would love that. No, she wouldn't like that very much. You, you would help like a lot of people making better lives see it from that angle, right? It's about growing more confidence, just getting, attracting the people that you want to have it's in your all- life. Like, and yeah, man. I mean, it's a lot of like environment that you have around you. It's a lot mm-hmm. of establishing good habits, getting yourself in shape, brushing your teeth, washing your body, yeah. getting a nice haircut, getting clothes that fit you. I mean, having a little bit of money potentially always helps out being able to achieve something, having people in your life that pump you up versus hold you down or, or make you feel bad about yourself. So there are like some yeah. very core thing and also comparing. I mean, there's I guess there's a lot of things, but we can yeah. keep that for another episode, perhaps. Let's do it. All right, Joey. Thanks again, man. Stay healthy. And then see you soon.